Salam, here I am, back at it again and better than ever and today I want to talk to you if you are a recent revert or a born Muslim who just recently decided to start practicing the deen in a proper way and just doesn't know where to start. With this video I will give you a few tips and answer some questions that you might have so that you don't have to text me anymore. All the points that I'm making in this video are just my personal opinion. So if you feel like this stuff doesn't apply to you, then don't listen to me. You can just click out. I don't care, okay? I am just here to give you a little bit of input, you know what I mean? So if you decide to stay, then that's your decision. It's not my responsibility. You can just exit whenever you wanted to. Don't come into the comments and be like, oh my god, I don't like it. I don't care, okay? You can just leave right now. So first I want to clarify why I use the word revert and not convert. Muslims believe that every single human soul witnessed that there is only one God. This happened before you were given your physical body. This was stated by your soul. So a person who was born in a non-Muslim family, for example, and then finds their way to Islam is going back to the statement of his own soul. Because every single soul was Muslim in the beginning and it was us humans throughout our lives who decided to continue going towards that path or to go astray and take another path. Have. The path of disbelief! So the first thing I want you to keep in your mind, especially if you are a revert, is that once you have entered Islam, all your past sins have been wiped out. Your book is completely empty, completely clean, and the angels are just waiting to write down every single good deed you're about to do. And if you're not a revert but a born Muslim, then still do not let your past define you. You are not who your past is. You are your presence and your future. Do not let your past drag you down to a point where your present and future is in risk, but take your past to learn from it and don't repeat the same mistakes again. Repentance can wipe out sins in just a millisecond. It is never too late to change. However, it is very hard to do so. Take your time. Find yourself some people that you trust, that you want to talk to, that are knowledgeable and have a lot of empathy towards you. And don't shy away from asking questions. This is what Islam is for. It is a guidance for us in order to understand the world, the people around us and ourselves. One of the first advices I always give people who don't know where to start practicing is that they should concentrate on the five pillars of Islam. The five pillars of Islam are the foundation. Whatever you build upon it will be strong if the pillars, if the foundation is strong. And whatever you build upon a foundation that is very weak, that maybe has one missing, will be able to crumble down so very easily. The first pillar is the Shahada. It is best to fulfill this pillar while you're with witnesses who are witnessing that you have taken the Shahada and now have become Muslim. However, if you have no Muslim in your community that can be your witness, you just wake up at 1 a.m. and you're like, oh my God, I want to become Muslim. Of course, you can take the Shahada. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your witness. The second pillar is the prayer. There are some scholars who say that a Muslim who doesn't pray is not considered a Muslim. The worship is that which differentiates the believer from the disbeliever. Worshipping Allah is the most important thing that you have to do as a Muslim. In my opinion, the second pillar is the hardest pillar because it requires a continuous dedication. This is why we have to pay so much attention to it. It plays one of the biggest roles in a Muslim's life. The third pillar is paying zakat. The zakat is part of your wealth However, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Allah and Allah has instructed you to give this part of your wealth to people who do not have enough money, who need education, who need food, who need clothing and so on and so forth. So you have to pay part of your wealth to the needy people. The fourth pillar is fasting. And this is only required once a month throughout the year. It is actually something very easy in comparison to the prayer which has to be done every single day throughout the year except for the people who have been excused. And the last pillar which is the pilgrimage to Mecca. 
What I've noticed is that especially many born Muslims do not understand that reverts have to turn their whole lives upside down. It is something very hard and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. The Sahaba did not have to do everything from one day to the other, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them revelation bit by bit and slowly they changed their lives step by step. Yes, all the things that the Sahaba used to do in the end are still obligatory for you. Just because the women did not wear the hijab in the beginning times of Islam does not mean that you get a pass on it just because you're a revert. It is still an obligation upon you. However, always keep the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your mind and keep your stuff to yourself. I don't know why we feel the need to constantly tell people what is going on in our lives. People feel like they're entitled to know updates about your life. What do you want to study? Are you pregnant? When will you marry? And people are totally shocked to find out that the person that is in their environment had something going on in the background something that they did not publicize. You do not have to go around and justify your actions that you do to make yourself feel happy. People will constantly give you their opinion on things that are just not of their concern. This is because people think that their worldly view is the only view people are allowed to have. Sometimes people giving us their opinion on topics can be helpful and beneficial. So choose the people that you are talking to about private stuff, choose them wisely. Sometimes we open up to people who do not have our best interest in mind, but their own. And sometimes these people can be our parents. And this is a struggle that many reverts have to face. How do I tell my parents that I am Muslim? You do not have to tell them. Always keep in mind that actions speak louder than words. Especially if you fear that your parents would become very angry, upset or sad by hearing that you are now Muslim. Most of the time, Islamophobes do not have a connection, they do not have a relation to other Muslims. They only hear the stuff that the media gives them, the propaganda, the false information and the fear that the media is trying to fuel. Your parents only want you to be happy. That is their biggest goal in life. Your parents only want the best for you in general. Make sure to show them that Islam is not something that puts you in danger, but Islam is something that pulled you out of your depression, your loneliness and gave your life a meaning that it never had before. At one point, your parents will notice that there is a difference in your behavior, in your character, in your mood. Have you seen that, Matt? That looks very oriental. Is that... Did you buy this? And at one point, they will ask you, what makes you so happy? And you can tell them that it was Islam. Make sure that your parents do not have pre-assumptions when they look at your actions, but view them as something neutral. And trust me, no parent that actually wants the best for the child will tell them, go back to how you were before, go back into your misery, because Islam is not good. Another thing that plays into the topic of keeping it to yourself is that you should keep away from the Muslim community at first. It's very sad for a Muslim to say this, but one of the biggest threats to reverts and also to other Muslims are other Muslims. This is because of the very foul character many Muslims have nowadays, especially with social media where people do not have the empathy anymore. Especially on social media, but also in real life, Muslims will continuously flood you with so much information. And not all of this information is information that you should take. For many people, culture or their own ego plays into their Islam. They make up new rulings or they have learned rulings that actually do not have anything to do with Islam but are born out of their own culture or out of the own interest that a person had and wanted to apply it to other people. If you want to go on Muslim social media, you have to be able to differentiate between people who give you righteous advice and people who give you advice that is based on no knowledge. Once you are able to differentiate between these things, once you are able to research in a proper way, once you have learned yourself enough to know 
This is what I have to do. These are my obligations. Once you have reached that certain level, you can go out to Muslim social media. It is best for us to focus on a small group of Muslims that we trust, that are righteous and that are knowledgeable. You can ask them so many questions and you can open up towards them in order to seek more advices and more knowledge. You have to be obedient towards Allah when it comes to the things that he made obligatory upon you. That does not mean that you are not allowed to use the intellect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the mental capacity to research, to understand and to question things, then use this capability because then your niya will change and you will get inshallah more rewards for the actions you're doing because now it's not just doing but you are actually putting your heart and mind into it and trust me no person ever has learned everything there will always be a person who has more knowledge than you and there will always be something that you can learn so where do we start i would give you the advice that you start with the essentials start with the things that are fart if you want to do the sunnah acts there is nothing wrong with that However, in my opinion, it does not make sense to look into sadaqah when you are not paying zakat. And it doesn't make sense to look into the sunnah prayer if you are not fulfilling the obligatory prayer first. So try to focus on the things that are clearly stated by our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Try to focus on the things that are obligatory, they are necessary. So now that you have learned the basic things that the Muslim has to fulfill, you want to gain a little bit more knowledge. But with what do I start? There is no wrong start. Islam connects every single thing. You will start somewhere and you will go into a spiral going through every single topic that you need to know. I can give you an example. Many people are very interested in the jinn stories. And then there are other Muslims who say, don't research about this, it's unnecessary. You should learn about something else first. And I understand where they are coming from. Knowing about the jinn is not as beneficial as knowing about who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, for example, or knowing the characteristics about our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, if the story of our Prophet is just not interesting to you at the moment and you really want to know about who the jinn are, there is no shame into looking into these things because you will learn about who the jinn are and then you will get to know who Iblis is and you will get to know who Adam is and through Adam you will get to know all the other prophets and end up at our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and through him you will learn about his wives about the Sahaba and so on and so forth SubhanAllah Islam connects every single thing so do not worry when people tell you that you are learning something unnecessary as long as it is truthful, as long as it's righteous, and especially as long as it's connected to Islam, it will never be a loss. Whatever was mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or by our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is never something unnecessary. If somebody would ask me, I would tell them, start to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. Because whatever ruling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us, it is never something bad, but always something beneficial and good for us. Sadly, we started to threaten our children, our neighbors, our friends with the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People are scared of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't love him anymore. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not the one who only punishes. He has 99 names and so many of them are describing his infinite mercy, his love. So don't ever give up. There is only one sin that is not being forgiven when you die upon it. And this is shirk. This is the prayer towards another being than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last tip is for every Muslim, check the sources. If somebody tells you something that you did not know about before, always look it up. Write it down and look it up at home or ask them for the source. Of course, if you are in a lecture and there is an imam or a scholar talking to you, you do not have to ask him for every single source. But if you talk to people and you know they have not studied it, they are just your friends or even strangers. 
ask them for the sources. They should always be able to provide you a source. There are three main categories that you can source hadith into. That are Daif, Hassan, and Sahih. The Daif hadith is a hadith that you should not read. It is a hadith that is most likely fabricated, that is most likely wrong. Hassan is a good hadith. It's a hadith that you can read and that you can take. But the chain of narration isn't perfect. Therefore, you should stick to hadith that are Sahih. Sahih hadith are the most authentic hadith. The chain of narration is almost perfect. And then the best thing that you can do, especially if you do not speak Arabic, is that you take the hadith, you search up a scholar that you trust and let him interpret it, let him explain it. Because sometimes the translation is faulty and can give another meaning. Arabic is such a precise, complex language that is almost impossible to translate into any other languages. Sometimes the translators have to use words that just give the wrong meaning and can give you the wrong idea of something. Therefore, listening to a knowledgeable person who has studied hadith, explaining it to you would be the most beneficial. And you can also apply this to the Quran. Reading a translation can sometimes be misleading. Therefore, it is best, in my opinion, to read multiple translations of the same verse or to take that verse and listen to an explanation of a knowledgeable person. And that's about it. I have nothing else to say. I've talked too long. My sore is throat. Yes, I said that. And don't regret the things that you did in the past, but do it better next time. And we see each other next time. Bye!